Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, the tough-talking, advice-giving show by the not-really-mean, mean lady, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of Mean Lady Talk and Podcast, and welcome to episode 61. I am really glad that you guys are here, and I wanted to thank my Patreon supporters, which I will do in a second. I wanted to let you guys know that I appreciate your support. The minimum amount that the podcast costs each month is $123. That doesn't take into account editing. Editors are very expensive. Anyone that I've talked to has been... Be- have have quoted me between $75 and $125 for a 45-minute podcast. Now, that's why I spend four to six hours doing my own editing, but I could free up and I could be doing more episodes on a more frequent basis if editing didn't take me so long. But at this rate, I'm not really going to be able to do that. So if the podcast means anything to you, please go to MeanLadyTalking.com. Go down to the button that says Become a Meanie and Become a Meanie. You will be in very good company. Speaking of good company, the meanies that I want to give a shout out to this very episode are Fiona, Jonathan. Thank you guys so much for being wonderful, supportive meanies. Thank you to Melissa, thank you to Stephanie, and thank you to Whitney. I really, really appreciate you guys, and I hope that you have been enjoying your bonus episodes, and if you have mini episode, that you're enjoying that. So if you want to sign up, become a meanie, I really appreciate the support. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was people have been asking me about some of the true crime stuff. The the Chris Watts podcast that I had out was done before he came clean about everything in his prison interview where he called back the people that were originally investigating his family's disappearance and he called them in and he decided to confess everything to tell them exactly how it happened and it was actually much more gruesome than we ever thought. Also, his girlfriend's name was Nicole Kessinger, and I did record a podcast on her, but it really came off really snarky, sarcastic. And when I do the true crime podcast, I really want it to be informative to people that are going through breakups, may, might have been involved with personality disorder people. And the Jodi Arias stuff is going to take multiple podcasts and I'm not going to try, I'm going to try to not have them on regular release days. I'm hoping that I'm just going to be able to put a series together and release them back to back to back to back for people that are interested in them. But there was a lot in there as well as the Emma Walker case that I want to talk about because Emma Walker was a young, gorgeous high schooler who was killed by her boyfriend, Riley Gall. And I watched Riley Gall's trial. It was really disturbing. A lot of things that his friends said were really disturbing. The quality of their relationship, it was a high school relationship, but it was very chaotic. He was very obsessive. He was very controlling. And like Jodi Arias, who killed her boyfriend, Travis Alexander, and Shani Hubris, who killed her boyfriend, Ryan Poston, Riley Galt would do things like, I'm going to kill myself, blah, blah, blah. I mean, even his best friends were tired of listening to him threaten suicide every time Emma was angry with him or she was trying to break up with him. So there is a lot to be informed about these relationships. So when I talk about the true crime trials and perpetrators and victims, there is something for everyone in these podcasts. There is something that was really informative. Chris Watts seemed to be the happy family guy and then he offed his entire family. But there are so many different things that people can really learn about some of these cases and people want to believe, well, that would never happen to me and I'd never be like that. And for some of them, like Chris Watts, it's hard to say how you can take stuff from that 
that situation and really pull anything out that people can learn from, but there are. So I am going to do another Chris Watts episode and I'm going to do one on Nicole Kessinger because I wanted to talk about his confession and I wanted to talk about Nicole Kessinger. There are things for people to learn from them. Even if it seems like it's so out of the ordinary, it's so crazy that it would never happen to you and and nothing like this would ever happen. You can't imagine a million years. Of course you can't. But there are things in each of these relationships to learn from. And even if you don't think in a million years you could ever find yourself in a situation like Travis Alexander, Ryan Poston, as I've said in so many podcasts, they were at the opposite ends of the spectrum as far as how they grew up. And they both and their lives ended the exact same way by a crazy obsessive girlfriend who had they had tried to get rid of but couldn't get rid of because they would soften when she would threaten suicide to someone like Emma Walker and Emma Walker's parents really tried to interfere in her relationship with Riley Gall and they did all the right things and she was moving on and she was really turning the page and moving on. But there are things in that relationship and the ending of that relationship that we can learn from. And even if you could say, I would never, ever, ever, ever be in this situation. Emma Walker and Riley Gall were high school kids. What the hell do I know about that? Blah, blah, blah. You might have friends who have high school kids age and you might be able to take something from these podcasts and explain it to them. So anyway, that's all I want to say about the true crime stuff. People have been writing me saying, when are you going to do another Chris Watts? When are you going to do Nicole Kessinger? When are you going to do Jodi Arias? Yes, I'm going to do all of that. As I said, these podcasts take a long time to edit. And if I can get the, if I can get a certain amount of support for the podcast, I'll be able to push out more material. And somebody also asked me about the, uh, more than one person, several people asked me about the sex show. And I've been getting a lot of email from that. I only want to do one sex show. So I'm giving it a little bit of time. So keep sending me your email. Let me know about situations. I cannot believe the amount of people who had a crazy ax, who got one of those scammer emails and they fell for it and they believed it and they were all upset. Oh my God, people are watching me masturbate to porn, blah, blah, blah. There was one, I got one email after I had talked about this on a previous podcast and she said that she got, that her boyfriend got a similar email and when he called the police about this, his defense was, It wasn't a teen site that I was on, which is hilarious. That was like his big defense. But in the email that I got, they said something about being on a teen site. Now, they didn't say they were young kids or teenagers. They just say teen site. And I'm sure that they keep it as generalized as they can. But apparently this guy had gone on porno sites, had been doing stuff in front of his computer, had freaked out. And his big defense was... A warranteen side. So that's pretty funny. So I'm going to talk about all that because I received several emails like that. I thought it was the only part. Remember when I talked about this? I said, I said, what are the chances that they send these emails out and somebody's going to go, oh my God, you caught me. Apparently I was a little naive about that. Apparently there's people that are going, oh my God, you caught me all over the place. (laughs) I'm not one of them. So anyway, keep sending me your questions, the topics, the things you want to listen to, and hopefully we'll get to the sex show before I have to end the podcast because it's not being supported. Hopefully we'll get to the sex show before that. Now, also, the podcast about the live studio audience, I still need somebody to feed me questions. As I said, when I had my Sunday night radio show, I did it all by myself. And a lot of times I'd be talking. I wouldn't realize that there were other people in the queue waiting or I didn't know what the what the question was. And I wasn't sure how much time that next question was going to take, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to work with me, all you have to do is, and nobody has to see you, nobody has to know that you're there, is just send me text or emails or something. We'll figure this out during the podcast so that you can let me know who has questions, you know, what and what those are. So I just need somebody to kind of work the back end 
for that show. And I would like to do that show. And I'd like to do that show this summer. So come on, guys, let's go. Now, we just had an, an incident in the Facebook group where somebody was seeing somebody. It was pretty early on in the relationship. And wasn't sure how she felt. There were signs that he might be a player. She had had problems with trusting people before. There was all kinds of red flags going on. And he had assured her that even though in the past he had kind of screwed around, he wasn't like that anymore. Bah, 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 bah. So she wasn't sure if she should trust him or not trust him or whatever. And somebody came into the line of discussion and said, well, love is is pain. And of course, many people said, you do realize that that's not the philosophy of this program. At the end of GPYB, getting past your breakup, and all through getting back out there, I talk about the exact opposite, that love isn't pain. Love doesn't have to hurt. And anybody who believes that has been listening to way too much pop music. I remember when I was trying to figure out if my boyfriend at the time, who's my first husband, was telling me the truth, I heard Fleetwood Max tell me lies, tell me sweet little lies, and I was like, hmm. And I know that it's ridiculous to even begin to think that pop culture dictates our relationships, but they do. I mean, we have this overblown romantic notion that love is difficult and and it's not true. Life is difficult. Love is an action. And both of those sentiments come from M. Scott Peck. Love does not have to be a problem. And relationships do not have to be work. Now, I believe, and I've talked about this over many years, and I've done a video on Don Dinkmeyer's program, which I took Don Dinkmeyer's program when my oldest son was three years old and I had lost him in a store. And I think I've talked about this on another podcast. If not, shoot me email, meanladytalking at meanladytalking.com, and I'll tell the story some future date. But I had lost him in the store and I was just flipping out because the kid didn't listen to me, just didn't listen to me. So my first husband and I went to a class and we took this class for several weeks and it was the Don Dinkmeyer, Gary, Gary McKay or Gary Kay. I don't remember exactly what his last name is. I'll have to look it up. But um, I took the, the Dinkmeyer course and I used that course through four children and a stepdaughter the entire way. And like Melody Beatty says, the three time rule with boundaries. When on the third time, you're negotiating with yourself. The Dink Meyer program is basically the same thing. On the third time you act, if the kid's not listening by the third time you act, you don't argue, you don't threaten, you don't cajole, you act. When I would be in the store and my kids would be fooling around, I would say one more time and we're leaving. And if they did it one more time, we'd be leaving. The first time I would say, guys, you got to cut this out because you know, if you keep it up, we're going to leave. The second time I would say, guys, one more time and we're leaving. The third time, up and out. Period. End of story. I left shopping carts. If I was in a restaurant, I left entire tables full of food. Of course, I paid for them on the way out. I remember we went to a Chinese restaurant. The kids were fooling around. I told them twice. I said, you know what? On the second time, I said, you know what? If this continues, I'm leaving. And they looked at me because it was a Saturday night. It was very crowded and we were going to have dinner and then we were going to go to the movies. And we had had this plan for a week or so. I didn't have a lot of money. I was taking them to a very cheap movie theater, but it was something that I did quite often. I tried to I tried to take the kids out almost every Saturday night. And if I didn't take them to the movies, I'd take them roller skating or whatever, but I would always go someplace for dinner. So I said to them, and we were in the corner. I remember this night like it, like it happened yesterday. We were in the corner of a very crowded restaurant. We had this big table and they kept fooling around, fooling around, fooling around. And I said, one more time and we're leaving. We had just ordered the meal. We had our drinks had come, but our meal had not come. They kept it up and I said, you know what? We're leaving. Let's go. And we got up. I paid for the drinks and had the food come. I would have paid for the food, but the guy said that I only had to pay for the drinks. That's what I paid for. We went home. We didn't go to the movies. And the next time we went out, I said, am I going to have to leave in the middle of the meal? No. 
I never again left in the middle of a meal. Never again. If you put in the painful stuff up front, it doesn't happen again. I left grocery stores. I left restaurants. I left movie theaters. I remember going to movie theater once and they kept changing sheet seats. They kept put, I used to let them go sit by themselves if they wanted to, as long as they stay quiet. But I was watching them change seats all over. And then I went up to them and I said, one more time, you change sheet seats and we're going. They changed seats, we went. In the middle of the movie, a movie I really wanted to see. You don't have to do it that many times. Now, why I'm talking about this is because relationships are similar. You know, as it says in Getting Back Out There, not all relationships take work. You can put the work in at the beginning. When you first become a couple, you do the couple's inventory and you don't have to do it formally. You don't have to sit down and say, hey, I have this book and it has this couple's inventory. Let's sit down and do it. You don't have to do it. You can read it by yourself and you could think about it. You could think about the different questions and the different things that it's asking because basically you want to figure out what kind of couple are we going to be? What is our partnership going to look like? Are you my 3 a.m. person? And I know so many people who rush to judgment on this, knowing that someone's your 3 a.m. person does not come easy and it doesn't come quickly. You really have to work things out. And there's many things that you haven't even figured out yet. And I'm working on the attachment book and I've talked about this on one of the attachment podcasts. And I don't know if it was one of the public ones or one of the ones that was a bonus for Patreon subscribers, but there was somebody in the book and he distanced from her after his best friend died. And the relationship basically went downhill and she kept blaming the relationship going downhill on his friend dying. If his friend never died, we'd still be together. If a friend didn't die, we'd still be together. As soon as he gets over his friend dying, we'll be together again. It never happens. He never came back. People lose people close to them in their life all the time. If you can't handle that, you don't belong in a relationship. Many times parents lose a child and it's a terrible, terrible thing to happen. It's the worst thing that can happen to a person is to be a parent who loses a child of any age. And many times what happens with parents is they each go to their own corner and lick their wounds and they don't know how to bridge the gap that now exists between them that either wasn't there before or the gap is now magnifying problems that were there before. Everybody goes through pain and loss and sometimes one of us goes through it in a different way than the other one. This woman didn't have any feelings toward the guy's best friend. She was, he he was just an acquaintance of hers. He He was somebody she hardly knew, but she felt his death on some level, but not like the level of her boyfriend. And she kept trying to be understanding, understanding, understanding. Well, he had this loss. I can't leave him. But he left her. She didn't leave him. He left her. And the thing is that when you're doing the couple's inventory, you're not going to be able to say, well, if your friend dies, you're going to push me away. I mean, those are things that are unforeseen. You can't really see it. You don't really know it. But there are many things you can try to figure out. Yes, there are going to be things that happen that you could not possibly foresee when you sat down to do the couple's inventory. But try to think of as many things. Think of things that happen to you in other relationships. What will you do if an ex-girlfriend suddenly pops up and says, I've been to therapy, I've changed, I love you, and I want back. And a lot of times people will say, oh, I would be like, hell with you, blah, blah, blah. But sometimes there can be a little suspicion over, is really that what they would be doing? Maybe, maybe not. All relationships take work in the beginning when you're sorting all this out, when you're fleshing all this out. But like the thing with the kids, when you leave the restaurant the first time, you probably never have to leave it again. Say, if it keeps up, we're leaving, and you leave every single time. If I have to pull this car over, I'm pulling it over, and we'll sit there until everything quiets down. I did that with my kids a few times. They'd be screaming at each other on the way home from visiting their father's house. They were always completely out crazy. And I'd pull over to the side. I wouldn't say a word, and I would just stay until they were quiet. I wouldn't say a word. And they could scream and yell and carry on. And they would think that they were going to outlast me, but they never did. I just sat there and I didn't even have anything to read. I didn't have a phone. I didn't have anything. I would just sit there looking out the window. 
I didn't even have to tell them why we were sitting there. They knew why we were sitting there. And when they stopped, I would get up and go. And if they started up again, I would pull over again. It could take us two and a half hours to get home from a 45 minute drive. I didn't care. But they stopped doing it if they wanted to get home anytime soon. You put the work in up front. You do the work. You ask the hard questions. You don't try to skirt around them. If somebody says, like this woman did in that, in that post that we were just talking about, when she said that the guy said, oh, well, I used to be the type of guy that would go home and muck around with other women. Really? Well, what changed? I mean, what did you do to change? Because people like that usually don't change. I mean, there has to be some earth shattering thing that happens that changed him. And if he can't point to anything, that's a problem. Put the work in up front. Be willing to do the work up front. It's not true that all relationships take work forever and ever. All relationships can take work in the beginning when you're trying to figure each other out. And I go through this in my description of my relationship with Michael, but I also lived with somebody else where we we worked this out early on. And sometimes it wasn't easy. And sometimes it was like, push me, pull me. But we worked it out in the beginning. And after a while, we had a very nice natural rhythm. And if we hadn't gotten into that rhythm, one of us would have left. Because by the time we met each other, each of us just wanted a peaceful life. But at the same time, we recognized that there were certain differences that we had that worked for the relationship in some areas and didn't work in other areas. There were some glaring personality differences. And sometimes that worked for us and sometimes it worked against us. And we had to figure it out on a case-by-case basis early in the relationship. And that didn't mean that nothing happened for the next few years. Love is not pain. Love is an action. And all relationships don't take work after a certain time. It should not be a struggle continuously. Yes, in the beginning, you have to work things out. But you also have to figure out how easy or hard this person is going to be to work things out. So put in all the work up front, set the boundaries, stay true to your standards, and you can do this. If you have boundaries, you have strong boundaries, you have real boundaries, and you absolutely mean it, you don't have to keep revisiting it. Because I'm telling you, on the third time you're negotiating with yourself, I have a client who always wants more time, always wants more time. For them to see each other. They see each other two to three times a week. They've been seeing each other about a year and a half. It's never changed. It's been the same. And who knows, you know, what he's doing the rest of the time. There's also sometimes we'll have a friend getting married or something and he won't invite her as the guest. If you're with somebody for a year and a half and they don't invite you to be a guest at a wedding, there's something wrong with that. You're on two different, totally different pages. And she says to him all the time, either we need to spend more time together or we need to end things. But she says it all the time. He's not listening. He doesn't care. He knows she doesn't mean it. I know she doesn't mean it. I said to her, why are you telling me this? I know you don't mean it. She's like, oh, yes, I do. I said, no, you don't. You've been saying this forever. He's not listening. I'm not listening. I said, you're probably not even listening to yourself. You have to get true to yourself early in a relationship. And the reason why I'm bringing this up on the heels of talking about teenage relationships with Emma Walker and Riley Gall is because if you're a parent or you have friends who are parents, you have to take a look at what these kids are doing. You have to teach your kids a three-time rule. And the best way to teach your kids a three-time rule is to enforce a three-time rule. You do that again, and I'm taking your phone away. You do that again, you're not going out Saturday night. You do that again, I'm taking your computer away. You have to have the three-time rule across the board with absolutely everyone. And if you have it with your kids, then when you tell your kids how to behave, you know that you've given them tools for living, tools for life, tools for relationships. It's hard at the beginning, but I'm telling you, if you enforce them, there won't be constant nagging. There won't be constant punishments. When you say something, they will know you mean it. And they will understand that you meaning it helps them to say difficult things and to mean it. And something that I've told people a lot is that when you are instituting the three-time rule, don't threaten things you cannot go through with. And I talk about this as far as accept it, change it, and leave. That's another set of rules that I try to talk to all my clients about. Accept it, change it, or leave. Now, if somebody's doing something that you cannot accept, the next 
step is to see if you can change it. Like the client who's not getting enough time with her guy. She has said multiple times, I would like to spend more time together. I would like us to spend more time together. And he will say, yeah, you know, we should do that. But, 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 but he yeses her to death. That's what he does. He yeses her to death. Sure, babe. Anything you want, babe. We'll get there, babe. Always sweetie. Always kind. Always like, oh yeah, not a problem. He doesn't argue with her. He just does exactly what the hell he wants to. That's not compromise. You saying, can we do this? Somebody saying, yes, we can. And then no, they don't. That's not compromise. That's ignoring you. That is saying yes when the real answer is no. They're saying yes, but they're acting no. So that's not changing it. You have to decide how long you're going to take to change something. This is with friends. It's with relatives. It's with your children. You don't get many chances to change things. It either changes or it doesn't. And then the last one is leave. Now, of course, if it's your children, you can't leave. But that can be the time where you have to institute the punishment, take away the phone, take away going out, take away the computer, take away the clothing allowance, take away something. Boundaries say, I begin and end someplace and you begin and end someplace else. And that is especially true for our children. We have to let them know we are not still attached by the umbilical cord. And with kids, and I tell parents this all the time, I find that the parents that have no boundaries with their kids, who refuse to enforce any punishment, who let the kids ride roughshod all over them, are the ones that the kids are nasty to, insolent, do what they want, because there's no consequences. But that's not the only reason. The other reason is that they don't respect you. But the biggest reason is that you don't make them feel safe. I tell parents this all the time. The kids are always thinking, and somebody told me this a long time ago, and I absolutely believe it. If you can't keep yourself safe against us, how are you going to keep us safe against anybody who tries to come in this house and kill us or maim us or kidnap us or do something terrible to us? You setting boundaries with your children, you setting boundaries with your partner says, I have our back. And with kids, it's like, I will protect you. They need to know you can and will protect them. If you're letting these snot-nosed little kids run all over you, say whatever the hell they want and do whatever the hell they want, there is some part of them that knows intuitively you cannot and will not protect them because you're incapable of it. Somebody could come in and just have their way with the entire family and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. If you can't get your snot-nosed kids under control, and it doesn't matter if they're three, if they're seven, if they're 11, if they're 17. And I saw this, I saw, I see kids every single weekend in the grocery store, screaming, yelling, carrying on. My kids would have been in the car so fast, their heads would have spun. And I wouldn't care if I was online getting ready to check out. We would have left and they knew it. I only left the store. I only left the grocery store, I think twice. I left a restaurant once. I left the movie theater once. And when I said to them, keep it up, we're going to leave. They knew I meant it. I took them away many times. And whenever we'd be away, I would say, if you guys act up, we're leaving. I don't care how much I pay for this vacation. We are leaving because you don't deserve it if you can't listen to me. And when they were adults, right after Michael passed, we went to the Dominican Republic. Every one of them was out on their own, except for my youngest daughter. Every one of them was out on their own. And I said, any arguing, any fighting, any disruption. Now this is grown kids. And I said, any disruption, any fighting, any upset, and you're paying for your own trip, the plane fare and the hotel. And I made them agree to that before we left. And they knew that I would hold them to it. You have to have a track record of absolute consistency with absolutely everyone. Boundaries are the most important thing in your life. If you are too much of a coward to enforce boundaries, everyone in your life is going to ride roughshod over you. And there's going to be nothing you can do about it until you grow a freaking backbone. That's what you need to do. And when I talk to people about going no contact, I know what I'm talking about. You do not talk to your ex that you have children with in text or calling unless it's a dire emergency. You 
confine them to email. And if it gets out of hand, you confine them to email once a week. Say Tuesdays a day we email. Keep everything for that. And the minute you insult me, I'm deleting it. And that's it. And one, and again, the three time rule once or twice say, you know what? You called me blah, blah, blah on sentence three. And I deleted it. I didn't read past that. If there's something that you need me to know past that, I don't know it because I told you I refuse to be insulted. And if you continue to insult me, I'm going to continue to delete it. You absolutely have to have boundaries. You absolutely have to let other people know. You begin and end one place and I begin and end another place and never shall the two meet. Whether it's your three-year-old, your eight-year-old, your 18-year-old, your partner, your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, the people at work, no matter what it is, you need to let people know you begin and end one place and I begin and end another. You cannot let people ride rough shuttle all over you. Because if you do, you're going to be miserable. You're always going to be miserable. You can say, and I can tell you that the world responds positively to good boundaries. I mean, they might call you a name. They might say, oh, yeah, she's like, so. I mean, I've been called a hard ass over and over and over again. I don't care. Mean lady talking. Yeah, mean is an absolute compliment. If I say difficult things that other people find hard to say, and I say them, it's to keep me safe in the Facebook group, it's to keep the Facebook group safe. In my life, it's to keep the people that I care about safe. With my clients, my boot campers, I teach boundaries and I teach them really, really well. And the people who follow my advice are the happiest people. It's none of your business what anyone thinks about your boundaries. We don't put our standards up to a vote. We don't put our boundaries up to a vote. And we don't put what people think about us up to a vote. I don't care what you think of me. I care what I think of me. And if I have to wake up in the morning and look myself in the mirror, I better be able to say nobody is taking advantage of me. Nobody, not now, not ever. People treat me the way I demand to be treated and not by running around screaming and yelling, carrying on, but just the way I live my life. You either treat me right, you treat me well, or you get the hell out. Love is not pain. Love is absolutely. And you can go to my books and you can read it and you can read it at the end of Getting Past Your Breakup and you can read it all through Getting Back Out There. Real love, true love between two people is about having a foundation with which to build your life, your the rest of your life, hobbies, interests, friends, career, kids, whatever. The rest of the stuff in your life, your relationship should be a foundation on which you can spring from and spring into the rest of your life. And your relationship should be a shelter in the storm. When life gets tough, when things are thrown at you, when everything goes wrong, your relationship is the place where you go for comfort, for care, and for help. If you don't have that in your relationship, it's not worth anything. Get out. This nonsense about love is pain is just that nonsense. Love is not pain. Love is an action. It's a wonderful action. It's a good action. It's a supportive action. And the way that you get to that is when you have strong boundaries at the beginning of your dating beginning of your relationship, go to your standards of compatibility inventory. Look at absolutely non-negotiables. Look at must-haves. Figure it out and then put things into place. And no matter how much somebody is cute, good looking, good conversationalist, funny, affectionate, whatever. If they do anything on your non-negotiables, you go. You make that commitment to yourself because your commitment to yourself is more important than any other person in the entire world. You have to make that commitment to yourself. And if you don't, you are going to be in deep doo-doo very, very quickly. Set up your boundaries, set up your standards of compatibility inventory, figure out, read about what real love is and getting past your breakup and getting back out there. And then demand that level of love and commitment from absolutely every person in your life. You can do this. Go to the affirmation section of the workbook or go to the Power Affirmations booklet. Go there and write out all the affirmations, all the acceptance statements, all of the even those statements, all the commitment statements, everything that it walks you through. 
and make sure you absolutely do those every single day. Shore yourself up. Do it with affirmations and positive self-talk and making absolute commitments to yourself that these are my boundaries, these are my standards, they're not up for a vote, nobody gets to say, they're mine and mine alone. You can do this. Go to the workbook, go to the Power Affirmations booklet, get those in place. There's boundary section in the workbook, there's boundary sections in both books. Go there, do the work, you can do this. This is Susan Elliott, host of Me Lady Talk on podcast. Please go to MeLadyTalking.com, become a meanie. Please rate and review. Please join us in the Facebook group. Please go to the Mean Lady Talking Facebook page and like us. And I will talk to you guys next week. Take care, everybody. Susan Elliott signing off, Mean Lady Talking Podcast. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.